I am Jung myung uk a specialist in oral and maxillofacial surgery. This lecture covers the basic principles of Dio Navi and the basic placement method. This lecture consists of practical lessons to help those new to Dio Navi to perform implant surgeries immediately. Let's get started. The surgical guide for Dio Navi surgery looks like this. This is a resin part to seat the guide to the teeth. And this is a metal sleeve. When manufacturing a digital guide for surgery, two types of digital information is needed. One is the CT data. The other is intraoral scan data. The CT data gives us information on hard tissues such as teeth and alveolar bone. The intraoral scan data gives us information on teeth and gingiva. Using the common information, which is the teeth, we go over a process of combining the two types of data. This combining process is called merging. The picture you see now is the merging process of the CT and intraoral scan data. After arranging the virtual crown in a proper location on this data, you can mark the structures that you must be aware of, such as the inferior alveolar nerve. Next, you can virtually position the implant on the optimal location of placement on the program. The Implant Studio program is used to make a guide. Before we move on, let's watch a video about the whole process. The surgical guide made through this process is sent to the clinic to see if the guide fits well in the patient's oral cavity. Here is a small window on this side. Through this window, you can check whether the guide fits well on the teeth. If the guide fits well, you can proceed with the surgery according to the surgical protocol. Usually, guide surgeries are done without incision. The advantages of Dio Navi surgery involves significantly less post-surgical bleeding, swelling, and pain. To perform surgery using a Dio Navi guide, it is crucial that we obtain an accurate CT data first. 
if the CT equipment is outdated and the resolution is significantly degraded or it has noise issues, producing precise guides may be difficult. The easiest way to determine if the CT equipment in the clinic is accurate or not outdated is to use a CT jig. Place the CT jig on top of the CT and scan it. Then you will get this type of data. The accuracy of distance between points determines whether there is a horizontal error. Moreover, if the image is blurry, it determines whether there is any distortion in the image. If you see any horizontal errors or distortions, I recommend that you contact the manufacturer to calibrate it. The FOV may vary depending on the CT specifications. The cases you can handle may depend on the size of FOV in the clinic. If the FOV is 10 by 8.5 centimeters or more, you can proceed with the full arch case. If it is 8 by 8 centimeters, you can proceed to about 1 to 6 units. And if it is 8 by 5 centimeters, you can proceed to about 1 to 3 units. You can proceed with the case even with a very small FOV. In this case, produce multiple surgical guides to handle even long units without difficulty. There are a couple of ways to obtain intraoral scan data. One is to make a plaster model by taking an impression and scan the plaster model that will then be made into a guide. Another is to use an oral scanner for an oral scan and use the data to make a guide. Either way, you can produce a surgical guide. However, of these two, using an oral scanner to proceed with the intraoral scan is a better way to obtain an accurate guide. The data obtained in this way are then sent to the DioNavi Center through the DioNavi website along with the scan data, CT data, and the treatment plan. Through this website, various patient information can also be sent to the DioNavi Center. The center collects such data to establish a treatment plan. Upon receiving this data, well-trained professionals at the DioNavi Center performs a simulated surgery. The dentist will then check the virtually arranged data on the website. If you need to make adjustments to the placement location, you can leave a comment to ask for an adjustment. With the exchange of plans, data, and adjustment plans, a final location of placement intended by the dentist is determined. When the guide produced this way is delivered to the clinic, you should check whether the guide fits perfectly before proceeding with the surgery. If you look at the guide, you will see a small window where you can check the fitness of the guide to the teeth. When you see through this window and find that there is no gap between the teeth and the guide, it means that the guide is fitted well. If you can't check the guide fit, or if the guide is unstable, I recommend taking a CT scan with the guide in the mouth. The CT scan will show the metal guide sleeve and it will show a road. Follow this line to see the expected direction and angle of placement. Check whether the angle and direction match the initially planned placement direction to see whether the guide has been manufactured properly. To proceed with the surgery using DioNavi, first, you will need a CBCT at your clinic. Other things like oral scanner, 3D printer, and the implant studio program are not must-haves. However, since they allow precise, convenient, and quick production of guides, having them at your clinic will allow you to produce guides much faster and much more accurately. 
I mentioned earlier that to make a guide using DioNavi, we need to go through the merging process of the CT data and intraoral scan data. To ensure an accurate merging process, the data of the teeth, in particular, should be accurate. However, if there is metal prosthesis in the mouth, such as PFM, gold crown, amalgam, or metal crown, the CT scan will show blurred images called metal artifacts, and the blurred image around the teeth makes it difficult to ensure accurate merging. To solve this problem, we can use a specially manufactured alumina marker. The alumina marker is shaped like a small cylinder. It is attached using resin on the occlusal surface, and it enhances accuracy on the area that has metal artifacts. As you see, if you take a CT scan after attaching the alumina marker on the occlusal surface where many metal artifacts occur, the shapes come out clean on the CT scan. Also, you'll see that there is no blurring effect on the marker area and metal artifact can be avoided. There are several standards and principles in attaching the alumina marker. When you divide a jaw by one-third and you see even one metal prosthesis within one-third, the attachment of alumina marker is recommended. If metal prosthesis are found across the entire jaw, attach about three alumina markers for a sufficiently accurate merging process. Another aspect to consider regarding the CT data acquisition is related to scale. The CT data generally has more magnified images than actual intraoral scan data. For the merging process, we need to adjust the ratio so that the magnified CT data and the intraoral scan data are consistent. When adjusting the ratio, we select three tooth locations inside the oral cavity for merging. In order to merge like the following by adjusting the ratio of CT data three-dimensionally, we usually use these three points. With these points virtually connected, when the area where an implant is to be placed is located inside this virtual line, we can see that we are less likely to have horizontal and vertical errors. When the area to be placed is located outside this virtual line, we know that horizontal and vertical errors are more likely to occur. If the area to be placed is located behind the remaining posterior teeth, the placement location is outside the virtual line, inevitably leading to vertical and horizontal errors. In this case, we can use the resin marker on the posterior teeth to reduce the error. Next, let's consider how to obtain more accurate data using the resin marker. You will need a tissue adhesive called histoacryl to attach the resin marker to the gingival area. And the flowable resin is commonly used. Before we move on, let's watch a video on how to attach and use the intraoral resin marker. As you saw in the video earlier, 
we use a tissue adhesive called histoacryl to attach the flowable resin to the soft tissue in the oral cavity. As for resin, I recommend using colored resin if possible to increase visibility on the oral scan. Furthermore, before applying to the patient, take a CT scan to see if the resin is clearly visible on the CT. On the left is a comparison of merged data when the resin marker is not used on the posterior molar teeth. On the right is the merged data when the resin marker is used. Here in the gingival area, you can see that the merged data is more accurate when the resin marker is used than when it is not used. Thus, when placing posterior molar teeth, I recommend attaching the resin marker to the distal side of the posterior placement area. What if your clinic is not equipped with an oral scanner? In this case, you will need to have a plastic tray ready at the clinic. I will tell you how to use the plastic tray to send the scan data to the Dionavi Center. First of all, attach the resin markers to the patient's oral cavity correspondingly, like this. Then fill the plastic tray with the rubber impression material and acquire an impression from the patient's oral cavity. Take a CT scan with the tray placed inside the oral cavity. After the CT scan, take the tray out and send the impression material to the Dionavi Center. When you remove the impression material, you'll see here that the resin marker has accurately been registered. Pour the stone model here, and you will get a stone model with the resin marker attached. You can send the impression material to the center, which will be made into a stone model. At the center, the stone model is scanned, and surgical guides are produced through the process mentioned earlier. Let's see how we can acquire data from edentulous jaw cases. The case of edentulous jaws differs from the case with the teeth because there are no teeth to merge and the vertical height is not determined. You may wonder how merging is done if there are no teeth and if there is no area to merge. Let's take a look at the process applied to edentulous jaws. I will first take an example. The next case is placing implants in patients with partially edentulous mandible and fully edentulous maxilla. In the case of an edentulous maxilla, acquire an impression with the denture placed. In the case of the partially edentulous mandible, acquire an impression and send the plaster model to the Dionavi Center. When receiving this plaster model, the Dionavi Center performs the following procedure. First, they attach a marker to the plaster model. They scan with the marker attached. They design the splint on the scanned image obtained in this way. A splint is made based on the splint design and a splint is produced with a marker inside. At this stage, the Dionavi Center puts the wax rim like this on the top and sends it to the clinic. When we receive the guide produced with the wax rim, we can try it intraorally. As with the production of RPD, we should check the vertical dimension and occlusion to adjust the wax rim. Now, if the vertical height and occlusion are formed in the location you intended, take the bite impression in that location. Take a CT scan as it is. Take a CT scan like this, and when the patient comes out to the chair, send the stone model, bite, and guide obtained as such to the Dionavi Center, and the center will take care of the remaining procedures. Thus far, we have looked at how to produce accurate surgical guides. 
we saw how to obtain precise data and produce precise surgical guides. The Dionavi surgery relies on surgical guides, so accurate production of the surgical guide is extremely important. So please be sure to check every step of the way whether the preceding process has been carried out correctly. If you check, produce accurate guides, and perform surgery with them, you will be able to operate more accurately and completely. Now, let's learn about the process of surgery in detail. First, to operate with Dionavi, you need to know the concept of offset. Offset refers to the distance from the top of the fixture to the top of the sleeve. In principle, Dionavi offers default offset of 9 millimeters. If the gingiva is thick, the guide sleeve would be pressed by it. This will prevent the surgical guide from being fully seated. To respond to such a case, we offer offsets of 10.5 millimeters and 12 millimeters. Dionavi doesn't offer various offsets such as those of 11 millimeters or 13 millimeters. Please keep in mind that three offsets, 9 millimeters, 10.5 millimeters, 12 millimeters, have been set as defaults. Every drill in the Dionavi surgical kit has a baseline marked. You see here, some have what look like bands. There's also a drill with a stopper on the top like this, and the lowest line of most drills corresponds to the 9 millimeter offset. Let's first look at the drill called bone flattening drill. The lowest marking correspondence to the 9 millimeter offset, the next one to the 10.5 millimeter, and the next one to the 12 millimeter offset. You need to vary the drilling depth depending on the offset. Regarding this, I will discuss further later when we cover the drilling protocol. The same goes for the implant connector. The lowest line is the 9 millimeter. The line above it is marked as 10.5 millimeters and the line above it as 12 millimeter offset. There's no line marked on final drills. With the stopper on top, you need to adjust the length of the drill in this case. When drilling to place an implant of 10 millimeter likewise, the length that has been drilled may come slightly short if the drill is not extended because of the offset increase. So when placing an implant of 10 millimeters with the 10.5 millimeter offset, you should drill with the one marked 11.5 millimeters. When placing an implant of 10 millimeters with the 12 millimeter offset, you should operate with the drill marked 13 millimeters. These offsets and drilling protocol are described in detail in the surgical protocol. When we plan a surgery, a table like this is delivered to the clinic together with a guide. On the upper left of the table, offsets are displayed. This drilling picture too shows in great detail how deep it must be drilled and to which part of the marked line it must be drilled to. Just referring to the picture will be enough to perform surgery. Now let's go over the surgical kit used in surgery one by one. The Dionavi fixtures are broadly divided into the narrow type and the standard type. Depending on the type, the choice of surgical kit varies. We need to pay attention to the fact that the surgical kit varies depending on the fixture. In general, as mentioned earlier, diameters of 3.8, 4.0, 4.5, and 5.0 are of the standard type, and diameters of 3.0 and 3.3 are of the narrow type. When placing implants of the standard type, you should use the master kit. When placing implants of the narrow diameter, you should have the narrow kit ready to perform surgery. The surgery process can be divided into three stages. 
the pre-drilling preparation stage, the drilling stage, and the implant placement stage. Let's first take a look at the pre-implant drilling stage. The first drill to use is the tissue punch. The tissue punch serves to make a circular incision on the gingiva to create a path to which the implant is inserted after surgery. You can drill with the tissue punch at 100 RPM without irrigation. With a diameter of 3.0, the tissue punch is designed to minimize the loss of the attached gingiva. If a hole is open with the tissue punch in the gingiva where the implant is to be placed, the next drill to use is the bone flattening drill. The bone flattening drill is in the lower left part of the kit. It looks like this. The bone flattening drill flattens the upper part of the alveolar bone so that the drill does not slip during initial drilling. Proceed at 100 RPM without irrigation. If the cortical bone is thick, you can perform bone reduction at 1000 RPM with irrigation. If you see here, as mentioned earlier, there are several baselines. According to the offset in the surgical protocol, you can adjust the drilling depth. The bone flattening drill is also designed to minimize gingival reduction. Think of this drill as a tool to minimize the likelihood of slipping in an inclined area of the bone during initial drilling. The drills to use next are the drill tube and initial drill. The drill tube and initial drill are placed in the lower left part. The drill tube is used with the initial drill to prevent distortion of the direction during initial drilling. Considering that it may fall off during intraoral manipulation, I recommend using dental floss to connect it to the hook. The initial drill creates a path in the accurate angle and direction for future drilling. The initial drill is also used at 100 RPM without irrigation. There is a slight difference in angle between using the drill tube and not using the drill tube. Look at the picture. You'll see that an angle error of 0.72 degrees may occur when pushed as far back as possible if the drill tube is used, whereas an error of 2.89 degrees may occur if the drill tube is not used. This means that using the drill tube and initial drill would allow more accurate drilling from the beginning. The next drill to use is the final drill. The final drill serves to reduce the bone and expand to the diameter of the final implant to be placed. I also recommend using the final drill at 100 RPM without irrigation. You can drill like the following. The length of the final drill has to be adjusted according to the offset. As I said earlier, when placing an implant of 10 millimeters with the 9 millimeter offset, you should choose the final drill marked 10 millimeters. If the offset is 10.5 millimeters, add 1.5 and select the final drill marked 11.5 for drilling. If the offset is 12 millimeters, add 3 and drill with the final drill marked 13, and you can perform accurate drilling to the intended depth. The next drill is the profile drill. The profile drill is set up on the top like this. The profile drill is used to reduce the torque on D1 or D2 bones that has hard bone quality. Likewise, proceed at 100 RPM without irrigation. 
In the case of a 9mm offset, you can reduce to below the banded mark. Next is the abutment profile drill. The abutment profile drill is placed like this in the lower right part. This drill reduces the upper alveolar bone in advance that might be stuck when the abutment is fastened. During reduction, put it into the sleeve like this and turn it in a circular direction. Although the alveolar bone is usually flat, there are more cases that have inclined bones like this. In this case, when the actual prosthesis is placed afterward, the abutment may get caught in these areas, making it difficult to take an impression or tighten it. So trim it a little during surgery to make things easier for prosthesis procedures. So you can understand it as trimming these bones. The implant connector is a drill used for implant placement. You can use this drill to connect the implant fixture to the bottom and place the implant. The implant connector, too, has lines marked. The lowest corresponds to 9mm offset. One notch above corresponds to 10.5mm and the top to 12mm. You should follow the offset described in the treatment plan and meet the accurate placement depths to achieve implant placement at the intended depths. The implant connector is hexagonal when looked down from above. With the hexagonal shape, some surfaces are painted in light silver and some are painted in black. If you look at the parts painted in silver and the metal sleeve, you will notice a square shape in the shape of a key. Aligning these two angles, it is used when an accurate angle is set using the hexagonal shape when producing the abutment in advance. And direction of the hexagon is used to set an accurate angle of the pre-produced abutment. That's why you should place it at an angle when the abutment has been produced in advance. When the abutment has not been produced in advance, you don't have to place it at the angle. Sometimes the drill may not come out when you try to remove it after placement. If it does not come out by force, apply the principle of the lever to use a surgical curette or molt on the inner groove and it will easily be removed. The connector extension drill is placed in the upper right part. This drill is used to extend the length of the drill when it is difficult to place an implant because it gets caught on adjacent teeth. Next, let's talk about the narrow surgical kit. In the case of narrow type implant, it is similar to regular size implant placement. However, there is one difference. That is, the offset is fixed at 12 millimeters. There is no 9 millimeter or 10.5 millimeter offset when placing the narrow type. With a single offset set at 12 millimeters, everything from here on corresponds to 12 millimeters. Let's look at the tissue punch first. It's at the bottom left. As mentioned earlier, it serves to punch a hole for drilling afterward. In the case of narrow type implant, the metal guide sleeve itself is narrow. The drill is made a little smaller too. It's produced in a shape advantageous for placement in a narrow area such as anterior teeth. With a diameter of 3.0, the tissue punch is also produced to minimize the reduction of the attached gingiva. You can proceed at 100 RPM without irrigation. When you have punched a hole in the soft tissue with the tissue punch, you can use the bone flattening drill and the guide drill in the pre-drilling stage. Other than its narrow width, the bone flattening drill is the same as when placing regular size implants. There's one difference to note, however. 
When placing regular size implants, the lowest baseline corresponds to 9 mm offset, but for narrow type implants, the lowest line corresponds to 12 mm offset. This can be confusing since the lowest line is equivalent to 9 mm, then 12 mm offset must be two spaces above. You should keep in mind that in the narrow type implant, the lowest baseline of all drills is equivalent to 12 mm. The bone flattening drill, as mentioned earlier, serves to flatten the inclined upper surface to ensure precise drilling and minimize the likelihood of slipping. You can proceed with the reduction to the lowest line according to the 12 mm offset. The same goes for the drill tube and the initial drill. The drill tube is produced slightly longer than master kit. In the case of the narrow type, since the 12 mm offset is adopted as a default, it is prone to shake a little more. You need high precision because even a minor error could develop into a major one as you go down deeper. For improvement in precision, we have produced the drill tube in a longer shape. The final drill and profile drill are used in the same way as the master kit. Other than that, the 12 mm offset is adopted as default. The method of use is the same. Thus, you can proceed with the drilling in the same way. For implant connectors of the narrow type, there are two sizes. One is short and the other is long. They come in two sizes because placing the implant at the intended depth could be difficult if the implant engine head is caught by an adjacent tooth. In this case, you can use a longer implant connector for surgery. But in general, you can use a shorter implant connector for surgery. Whether short or long, please keep in mind that the lowest baseline is equivalent to the 12 mm offset. We've so far covered the surgical kit. Let's now find out the drilling sequence in general with the surgical kit. I mentioned earlier that the surgical protocol is delivered to the dentists. When you receive such treatment plans or surgical protocols, the first thing you need to check is the offset. You will see the offset at the upper left corner, and the lower left corner shows the diameter and length of the implant included in the treatment plan. In this case, the offset is indicated as 9 millimeters. The fixture scheduled for placement is a surgical protocol for placing 5.0 by 10 millimeter fixture. Let's take a look one by one. As I said earlier, proceed first with the tissue punch. Punch a hole in the gingiva with the tissue punch and grind the pointy bone area with the bone flattening drill. Since it has a 9 millimeter offset, the lowest line of these two bands is the baseline. You can drill down to that line. We have thus far covered how to make an accurate direction and path for drilling with the drill tube and initial drill. We now have to go through the process of widening to the intended diameter. At this point, you can use the final drill for drilling. Using the final drill, involves first expanding the upper area with profile drilling. Next, use the final drill to widen the diameter. Assuming that the ultimate goal is to widen 5.0, first widen at 3.8 with a blue band using the profile drill, and widen a bit more at 3.2 with a red band using the 10 millimeter profile drill. 
then widen a bit more and reduce the upper area using the 4.5 profile drill. Change the drill and drill with the 10 mm final drill at 3.8 to reduce the lower area. Lastly, widen the upper area with the profile drill at 5.0. Replace the drill with the final drill and reduce the lower area at 4.3 using the 10 mm profile drill. You see, it says D3, D1, D2 here. When the bone quality is relatively good, drill up to this point. When the bone quality is poor and very soft, drill up to the under drilling line and proceed with placement. In the end, you should drill to reduce the alveolar bone in the upper area, connect the implant connector, and proceed with the implant placement. With the implant connector, the lowest line is equivalent to 9 mm offset. So place the implant at the depth consistent with the baseline. Moving on, let's see what differences there are with the 10.5 mm offset. The overall drilling protocol is the same. The difference is in the drilling depth. In the case of a bone flattening drill, while drilling has been made up to this point with the 9 mm offset, drilling should be made one space above with the 10.5 mm offset. And later when drilling with the initial drill with a stopper or final drill, you will notice that the drilling length is added by 1.5 mm each, although the surgical protocol for placement of a 10 mm fixture is planned. This is because the offset is 10.5 mm. Here, the offset has been increased to 11.5 mm, 11.5 mm, 11.5 mm, so you should increase the drill length by 1.5 mm before proceeding with the surgery. Other than that, the overall process is the same as the previous one. And in the final implant placement as well, you should place the implant one space above the lowest baseline of the implant connector to position the implant with the accurate depth. If it is set 1.5 mm shorter, the implant may be placed 1.5 mm shorter from the target position since the offset is 10.5 mm. So when the offset is 10.5 mm or 12 mm instead of 9 mm, you should thoroughly check the depth and length of drilling. But it doesn't mean that we have to do all the calculations. Since the surgical protocol comes in with a list of these, what we need to judge is bone quality. The surgeon has to decide whether to under drill or to perform normal drill more, depending on the bone quality. You can refer to the surgical protocol to determine the drilling depth. Let's take a look at an example of a narrow type before moving on. As shown on the upper left corner, the offsets of the narrow type are all 12 millimeters. This one, if you see the bottom left, is the surgical protocol used in placing the implant with a diameter of 3.3 and 11.5 millimeter in length. Let's take a closer look at this as well. It's clear that the size is slimmer and narrower than the regular size. The metal sleeve itself is made in a narrow shape. Procedures other than that are almost identical. Let's go through this one by one, assuming that we are actually performing the surgery. First, put the patient under anesthesia and place the guide. Use the tissue punch to punch a hole in the upper area. These holes are for drilling the next drill. Once the holes are punched, flatten the pointy sharp bone in the upper area for easy drilling. That's when the bone flattening drill comes into play. The bone flattening drill too has a band like this. It is of the narrow type, so the lowest line is the 12 mm offset. So drill up to the lowest line of this band. 
After flattening comes the process of creating an accurate path. You will need the drill tube and initial drill. Insert the drill tube. As I said earlier, you can see that the drill tube is longer than the regular one. Insert the drill tube. Proceed with the initial drill. As you can see here, I first started with a short drill and then moved on to use a long drill. You should understand this step is an effort to increase precision. After securing the desired length using the initial drill, the next step is to use the profile drill to widen to the final width. Here too, under drilling may be performed depending on the bone quality. A little more drilling may be performed. When placing one with 3.3, you can use a 2.7 by 11.5 millimeter final drill as shown here to drill to the intended depth and the accurate depth and width. Next, when you place on the hard upper cortical bone, the torque may be too strong and may prevent the implant fixture from reaching the accurate depth, which may result in getting caught in the middle. So if the cortical bone is hard, it is marked here also. For D1 bones, reduce the cortical bone in the upper area using profile drilling. If there is an inclined bone that may get caught when fastening an abutment in the future, trim the bone in the upper area using the abutment profile drill in advance. And finally, use the implant connector to place the implant like this. As the default offset is set at 12 millimeters, place to the depth corresponding to the lowest line of the implant connector. We have thus far walked through the basic implant placement process. So far, we looked at surgical processes, including what the kit is made up of, what sequence to follow during drilling using the kit, and what sequence to follow during implant placement. At first, you may feel a little awkward with the drill and as to how to perform surgery with it. Since it is featured in the surgical protocol in great detail, you can follow the sequence and perform a few surgeries. After a couple of rounds, you will get used to the surgery method and use it for the better. While we have covered the basics thus far, now let's consider a few clinical tips that can be used in actual clinical practices. The first is about bone heating. As the surgical guide serves as a kind of umbrella, when irrigation is performed on the top like this, water may not be sufficiently carried over to the inside. In particular, in the case of supplying water to the implant engine, water may not penetrate to the inside as well as when performing regular surgery, leading to heat generation inside the bone. So using an irrigation syringe and needle, be sure to put it deep inside to cool the bone. When drilling, in particular, heat is easily generated from the deepest part. So when drilling, insert the irrigation tip to the deepest part and irrigate sufficiently. Usually, assistants help with the irrigation. They tend to irrigate only on the upper area. Like this, you should irrigate sufficiently with the needle tip inserted to the bottom to cool off the inside that is prone to heat. The literature shows that temperature may vary. Heat with temperatures of 44 to 47 degrees may cause bone heating. You should note that the bone heating symptom may occur even in warm temperatures. So keep in mind the cooling down tips above. You saw earlier in the drilling protocol that drilling was done at a low speed and without irrigation. A study of results showed that during high-speed drilling, heat rose to 58 degrees even with irrigation. So during high-speed drilling, make sure to irrigate. 
make sure not to drill too long at once. You should drill a little and cool it down, drill a little and then cool it down repeatedly. The protocol calls for the procedure in low speed and without irrigation because we were able to obtain the experiment result that when drilling at low speed 50 RPM, the heat did not increase significantly up to 10 seconds. So when you drill at low speed at about 50 RPM, you can proceed for a relatively long time without generating heat. Nevertheless, I recommend performing irrigation while drilling. Based on the experiment result, DioNavi made it an official protocol to perform surgery at a low speed RPM without irrigation. Even so, I recommend that the drilling time should not exceed 10 seconds. When irrigating, put it deep inside and perform. The second is the opening limitation. The DioNavi implants, if connected from the fixture to the implant engine like this, it will be 45.5 millimeters in length, which is quite long. Since the mouth opening in adults is usually about 40 millimeters, when placing the mandibular posterior molar, its length may present a challenge. Things can be more difficult if the mouth does not open as much as needed. So make sure to check for opening limitations when establishing a treatment plan. When there is a limitation to mouth opening and found that inserting such a long drill is not possible, I recommend drilling without inserting the drill tube during initial drilling. Initial drilling with the drill tube inserted is a way to increase precision. But for patients with opening limitation, after the drill has been inserted, this precision may prevent the drill from coming out unless the patient opens their mouth, which may be a big problem for us. Although a small error may occur, it is the very error that helps remove it in patients with opening limitations. So I recommend first using a 2.0 by 5 millimeter drill. Also, it's a difficult area to perform surgery on those with opening limitations or have difficulty opening their mouths. Since they open their mouth well at first and it gradually becomes smaller, I recommend operating first on the rearmost area where it is difficult to place implants when the mouth opens well at first. I also recommend giving patients some rest during the surgery so they could open their mouths well. And this is the most important. I recommend that you make it a habit to ask the patient to open his or her mouth to check for an opening limitation when establishing a treatment plan. In the case of opening limitation, when trying to place with an engine, it may be difficult to place it inside the surgical guide. In such a case, do not try to place it with an engine. Use the hand ratchet to place it. Using the hand ratchet, place it and turn it slowly like this to place the fixture slowly. Unlike simple placement, the DioNavi implant has a surgical guide so there is less shaking even when turned without a hand ratchet. So turn it slowly as guided and you can proceed with placement even in patients with opening limitations with very little difficulty. The next thing to consider is the bone quality. We should adjust the drilling extent depending on the bone quality. As I said before, depending on the bone quality, some cases require under drilling, while other cases require sufficient drilling in the surgical protocol. Then how do you judge bone quality? First of all, analyze the CT data to judge bone quality in advance. 
Feel the thickness of the cortical bone and the bone quality of the cancellous bone with your hand during initial drilling. It is most accurate. Where the bone quality is poor, I recommend under-drilling. Try placing the fixture after under-drilling steps 1 and 2. If torque occurs excessively during fixture placement or the fixture is not inserted to the intended depth, turn it in the opposite direction to remove it, proceed with further drilling to the next step and place the fixture again. I recommend that you go through these steps. Try this process a few times with the touch during initial drilling. You will get a sense as to which extent drilling is to be done. Later on, even when you rely on such feelings, you will have gathered enough information on how much of under drilling should be done, which will help you proceed without trial and error. That's why you should under drill when the bone quality is poor. Then, if the bone is hard, should you drill at a wider diameter? With the final drill, it's common to drill to the final diameter. If the bone is hard, use more of the leg of the profile drill that widens the cortical bone in the upper area. By use more, I mean there's a marked line. I said earlier that the lowest line is 9 mm offset. With 9 mm offset, when the cortical bone is hard, drill to a slightly deeper depth than the corresponding depth. You will find it easier to insert than inserting the fixture to a hard bone. You see, here's the profile drill. The final drill is at the bottom. The profile drill reduces the upper area and the final drill reduces the bone of the lower area. The upper area is associated with the cortical bone. The lower area is associated with the cancellous bone. But in some patients, the cortical bone is hard while the cancellous bone has poor quality. On the contrary, the cortical bone is very thin while the cancellous bone is very hard. As such, you may find various combinations. In this case, adjust drilling with two types of drills with more and less drilling. If the cortical bone is hard, perform more drilling with the profile drill. If the cortical bone is thin and not hard, you can use less or skip the profile drill. Even in the cancellous bone, if the bone quality is very poor, such as in the maxillary second molar, under drill until steps 1 to 2 using the final drill. First, you can proceed as described in the surgical protocol. Then, I recommend that the operator combine appropriate depth and width depending on the bone quality and drill. The following is what we call incremental drilling. It means to drill incrementally. I said earlier that you can improve precision if you drill with a short drill first and then drill with a long drill. Let me explain why. With the Dionavi implants, the final drill is shaped like this. The upper part has this plump part that serves as a guide as the surgical guide fits, and the lower part is the blade with which drilling is done. This blade is narrower than the guide, so if this drill touches the bone before it is guided, the drill will go astray. When the cortical bone is inclined like this, it may slip and be drilled in unwanted directions without being guided. If the pathway is incorrectly formed from the beginning, drilling will continue in a strange direction. While the drilling is going in a strange direction, the guide at the upper part is set in a different direction, so unwanted signs may occur. There would be noise and drilling may not be done properly. 
so especially in immediate implantation, many cases involve inclined cortical bones. In this case, especially in the case of an unguided state, when bone reduction begins, the drill slips after bouncing on both sides. Here too, it's not guided. When it is drilled, after it has slipped, as I mentioned before, drilling will be done slightly crookedly. The surgery will not proceed as intended. So in this case, if you use a short drill first, the plump guide is accurately guided and drilled at the same time. So in areas where it's easier to slip and requires higher precision, drill sequentially from a short one to increase precision. Like this, use a short one to create a path in the upper part. Next, if you use a long drill because the path has been created, drilling will proceed along the path drilled by the short one. Then you can drill more precisely without slipping. Let's consider the narrow bone. There are some cases with the alveolar bone very narrow, like a blade. The Dionavi implant is advantageous in that it does not require an incision. Opening the flap itself may cause bone loss, so it's obvious that we will get better results if we do not open the flap and prevent bone loss. Such is the advantage of using Dionavi in surgery when the bone is thin. But with an inaccurate guide, we may end up placing on the thin bone in the wrong direction. Thus, if the bone is thin, I recommend checking that the guide has elaborately been produced before proceeding to surgery. How do you check? As I said, take a CT scan once with the guide attached. First, check whether the angle and direction of the surgical guide at the top are consistent with those of the area you plan. If it's consistent, you can proceed with the surgery, but I recommend checking once more while performing the surgery. Perform initial drilling. Then attach the parallel pin here and take another CT scan. So, if it's not going in the intended direction, you can stop the surgery and make another guide afterward and perform the surgery. Or, in my case, I open the flap to proceed with the surgery. Anyway, if the bone width is narrow, it helps to check from time to time whether the surgery is being performed in steps as planned. Next, let's see the initial fixation and primary stability. Since it is closely associated with fixture failure, the initial fixation is crucial. When it feels that the initial fixation is not good, it is a good idea to under-drill, as I mentioned earlier. If the initial fixation of the fixture is not good, even with under-drilling, I recommend placing a fixture of a larger size. When you have a contract for a 5.0 implant, but you decide that a 5.5 fixture is needed because the initial fixation is not good, you have to use several different methods. Because 5.5 doesn't fit into the surgical guide of a common regular kit, in this case, remove the guide. First, position the 5.5 implant to a certain depth and place the surgical guide again. Check the exact depth through the surgical guide and place the implant in line with the depth. In particular, in many cases of extraction, the bone quality is poor. Then, I recommend increasing the implant diameter and placing an implant of a thicker size. Next is when the gap between the teeth is narrow. 
considering the diameter of the surgical guide when the adjacent teeth are collapsed or when the gap between adjacent teeth is narrow, it may be difficult to accurately position the metal sleeve on the surgical guide. In such a case, you need to prepare the adjacent teeth. Inform the patient in advance and prepare the adjacent teeth. Acquire impression through an intraoral scan, etc. To make the subsequent process easier, find out whether the adjacent teeth are collapsed or whether the gap between adjacent teeth is narrow. If the gap between the adjacent teeth is narrow and you need to place two or more implants, as you can see here, you have an option to produce two or more guides and place them through these two guides. So what to do with the narrow gap? It is important to identify whether it is narrow from the planning stage. We have so far considered the basic principles of Dionavi surgery. The process may be unfamiliar and difficult at first. Follow the process step by step and you will find that it is not difficult. I hope you have successful surgeries through Dionavi. Thank you.